Odessa city centre, anti-tank obstacles, concrete fortifications, sandbags and lots of barbed wire, local militia patrolling the street, air raid alerts go on and off. I was shooting an interview and an air raid siren went on. Somewhere there. No one is allowed on the streets after 9pm. There are curfew restrictions in place. Taking photos or video of street signs is not allowed. All city signs have been removed, like this one, or covered up, including the directions for tourists. This is done for a reason. As a measure against artillery attacks. The people. This episode is dedicated to Odessa, a truly incredible city. It remains Ukraine's key seaside resort after the country lost Crimea. It is also a strategic location in the ongoing war. I plan to go there myself, but there is no way they would let me into Ukraine. So I drove as close as I could to get to Odessa. There is about 50 kilometers between Odessa and the Moldova-Ukraine border, and 180 kilometers separating Odessa and Chisinau. This is the very heart of Moldova's capital city. This huge building, former Hotel National, now sports Ukraine's colors. And the big letters on top say, no to war. I couldn't go to Odessa since I'm a citizen of Russia. No Russians are allowed to cross the border. Luckily, Volodya Karamanov, a blogger from Moldova, stepped in. He was to go with the cameraman. But at the last minute, his mother asked him not to go, and he couldn't say no. So Volodya went from Chisinau to Odessa all on his own. He needs your support. He spent three days there talking to local residents, politicians and volunteers, hiding in the basements from air raids, talking to people who had lost everything. Subscribe to Volodya's YouTube channel. He travels around the world and posts great reports about it. And this is Volodya Karamanov, report from Odessa. This footage was shot in Odessa between the 7th and 9th of April 2022, about two weeks before the bombing took the lives of many innocent civilians on April the 23rd. To go to Ukraine during a war was not an easy decision. Yet here I am, exiting Kishina. I hope to reach Odessa today. Usually it took me three or three and a half hours. Yet today, I have no idea what to expect. How soon I can make it to Odessa through all the checkpoints in Ukraine. With luck, I should be there by the evening. If I get there at all. This road connects Chisinau and Odessa. Before the war, it was busy every weekend. Many Moldovans went to Ukraine to shop, to walk about, and generally do touristy kind of stuff. Odessa is two times bigger than Chisinau, or rather was. Many have fled. The entire trip is about 200 kilometers, but it's best to get a full tank in Moldova. I'm almost to the border. And this is the last gas station in Moldova on my way. I think I must get a full tank. Reports of gas stations exploding in Ukraine come every day, and I have no idea what to expect. Gas stations near the border now also serve as meeting points. People meet here and discuss the latest news. Lots of cars with Ukrainian license plates come to this gas station near the border. People meet, hug, drink coffee and drive on. About an hour and a half later, I reach the border security zone. The first thing you see is a lot of refugees. Note the sign children on this van and some people next to it. It looks like it's a happy reunion. Many have come here to pick up their friends and family leaving Ukraine. 
and to take them to Chisinau or elsewhere. But I also see some cars trying to enter Ukraine. As I come closer to the security checkpoint, I notice refugee tent camps. This is Palanka, a town on Moldova-Ukraine border that is also now home to a large refugee camp. Just a few kilometers separate me now from Ukraine. The camp is really big. People stay here until they get more permanent accommodation. I keep driving and finally reach the checkpoint facility on the border. No shooting is allowed here during the wartime for security reasons. So I'll try not to shoot in restricted areas to avoid problems entering Ukraine. I'd rather shoot more when I'm already there. Now I'm at the checkpoint. This is where I'll cross the border and the customs on both sides. About a hundred people are queuing here to get processed. Everyone is on foot. Those cars I saw before the explosive barrier are in fact the people waiting for these guys to cross the border. It's my turn for a security check now. They don't stamp the passport like before and just give a piece of paper instead. This is my pass and I'm good to go. I need to give this slip to the border patrol officer and I'm done. Hello? Can I go? Thank you. Queuing to cross the border from Ukraine are about a dozen cars. There's also some tents providing aid to refugees. I drive on past the border sign for Moldova, then for Ukraine. Next is a sign informing me that I'm entering the territory of Ukraine. I'm now a few kilometers into the Ukrainian territory. At another checkpoint. They check my ID rather politely and let me drive on. It took me less than a minute. To be honest, now that I'm in a war-torn country, I don't feel so good. I decided to stop, get out and catch a breath. You know, for the first time in my life, I'm entering a country with an active war zone. If you ask me, am I scared? I'll say I am. Because I've seen already two checkpoints guarded very heavily by armed soldiers. And I've never seen anything like this before. I made a stop in a village near the border to shop for a SIM card. The last thing I want is to have no connection in Ukraine. Now I'm online and can keep my friends and family posted about my whereabouts. If I couldn't do that, I'd be very uncomfortable. I pass the checkpoint and see these concrete roadblocks. They channel traffic into one lane and all drivers have to slow down. I cross the Dniester. There are sandbag barriers on both sides. I enter a town near the border. One thing that catches the eye is Ukrainian colors everywhere. On lampposts, by the road, on street signs, on residences, everywhere. One interesting detail for those who don't frequent these parts of Western Ukraine, that there are many signs in Russian. This one directs you to a cathedral. This one is for the market, and this one, tombstone manufacturer. Signs of more recent issues are in Ukraine. For example, this one, I provide shelter. Despite the war, gas stations are open and there are no lines. Sometimes they're short of certain types of fuel though. Here, for instance, they have no diesel fuel, but AI-95 gas is available. This one, out of stock. Next one is both AI-95 and AI-92 gas and diesel fuel. Banks are open, currency exchange services are available, with some restrictions though. Here, for example, you can exchange US dollars or euros for Ukrainian Havana, but not the other way around. Another 10 minutes and I'm in Odessa. One thing that strikes me is the number of anti-tank obstacles, aka hedgehogs. They're everywhere. Here is a city bus going around one to keep moving. Here, they're on a pedestrian crossing. It makes me feel as if I'm somewhere in Iraq rather than Europe. I went through seven checkpoints on my way from the border to Odessa's central area, which looks like one huge checkpoint. Concrete fortifications, sandbags and anti-tank obstacles are on every corner here. Sandbags, barbed wire, danger, mines, signs, anti-tank hedgehogs, every other step of the way. This is the obstacle course, this family, of a mother and three kids have to run in lieu of a normal walk. They're smiling, but everything around them only makes it even more bizarre. The purpose of these ubiquitous things is now common knowledge in Odessa. These obstacles can stop tanks or armored vehicles. 
They just either get stuck with them under the belly when they try to pass, or they can damage their tracks or wheels because they're pretty tough. But in most cases, they get stuck and can't move on. But not only tanks have the trouble of navigating Odessa's streets, it's because of these obstacles. I had to drive in circles like in a maze, and the navigation app was no help. My navigation app took me here, but the street is blocked. I'll have to find another way. By the way, the last time I visited Odessa was for New Year's. Now I can see how much the city has changed since then. Another thing that caught my eye was an abundance of Ukrainian flags everywhere on my way to the city centre. There's lots and lots of blue and yellow on the streets. Just a few months ago, they weren't there. The billboards in Odessa seem to be making stronger statements than out of town. Some say words of support for the Ukrainian army. Others thank those who chose to support Ukraine. Pretty much all the posters or billboards I've seen today are about the war. For example, this banner features some celebrities of the West who support Ukraine, including Paul McCartney and Ryan Reynolds. Graffiti on anti-tank obstacles is a special kind of art. They're sending the message to you know who. If I try to put it in decent words, it basically says, you're not welcome here. Over the first two days, I lost six kilos because I was so stressed. I checked my weight and I couldn't believe it. I started losing hair, I couldn't eat or drink. All I could do was keep reading the news feed. But then I thought, why? No one ever says anything. This is Yulia. This is how she prepped her apartment for possible airstrikes or bombings. I put some tape here and there. I covered some things. Others I just left the way they were. I removed the doors and put them under the sofa. All pieces of furniture that are heavy and come off and injure, I decided to put them all together in a pile. But the hardest part was to secure the windows. Glass is shattered easily by the blast. The first thing I did was to try and secure the window panes. First, they said to apply tape crosswise. Then, they said to do a grid dividing the glass into sections of about 15 centimeters. The latest advice was to apply tape in layers, one on top of the other, so it can withstand the blast. Yulia has been in Odessa since the war started. She says the city was panic-stricken first. At first, all the shops were closed down. When they opened, they were empty. You could walk into a store and see bags of potato chips everywhere, nothing else. They filled the shelves with whatever was left to just make people feel like there is some food for moral support, I guess. Then some food arrived. Sugar, grain, cereals, canned goods. Yulia bought enough food to last a month and she prepared her escape bags. Here they are. During the first air raids, She'd grab all sorts of things and only realize her mistake later. Now she's got it all figured out. Here I've got some winter clothes to keep warm. First aid kit, meds, bandages, disinfectants, lots of water, snacks. My laptops in the backpack. And in this little purse I've got my IDs, money and all must-haves like wet wipes, t-shirts and so on. Wow, it certainly seems like you're very well prepared. Well, man, new problems call for new solutions. That's for when it gets too way too scary, because you gotta leave when it has become too scary or the front line is less than 20 kilometers away, because they can close down the city and you're trapped. Believe it or not, Yulia thinks she's quite safe for now especially, if you compare to the situation in Ukraine's other cities. Compared to some other cities, I can say we are in heaven, because the hell on earth that's now in Mariupol. That's something you wouldn't wish on anyone. Odessa looks so empty. Even the city center is empty. The city looks almost deserted. Odessa streets have never ever been so silent. I dare not speak up because it spooks people. 
and I have to stop filming whenever soldiers or officers get into shot. When they do, they stop me and ask me to delete the footage. Also, when I approach some checkpoint, a group of old ladies stop me and ask me very politely but firmly, please don't film here. You will leave, but we will stay. All of the central streets are fortified. There is barbed wire everywhere. The sign here says danger, mines, although the local authorities never confirmed that any mines were ever planted on streets. Here is a fortification made of concrete blocks and sandbags. Is that for you? Sure, for my family, just in case. We can go down here. I've got stuff for cooking, water, pillows and blankets in my car. There is a folding bed. The underground parking lot is pretty safe. It's under the ground and the walls are thick. This is Dimitri. He recently moved into a new residential block of flats in the city centre. As of late, he frequents the underground level more often than his apartment. You know, there were explosions not so far from here lately. The 411th battery, then in the airport. It's pretty close, about two kilometres away. The entire building was shaking. Our army tried to fight back, so there was some action. But people get used to anything. It is simple. For better or for worse, people get used to anything. This is how it works here. People use some large wooden crates, the kind stores use for groceries, and put them on the concrete floor. Then throw an inflatable mattress on top, or some blankets, and an improvised bed is ready. These crates are labelled as taken, to make sure no one else takes them. They are of value these days. Right now the basement is empty, because there's no air raid alert. We had a lot of water, lots of fire extinguishers, food, even cookies. You know, people shared, tried to keep everyone reassured. We all pitched in water, meds, shared Wi-Fi, to make sure everyone could stay online. And it was free for everyone. People did everything to help each other. You see, people next door didn't know better, but we heard that it's best to remove that doormat because perps can see if it stays in one place, they can rob the place. So the looters can see this way of your home? Yes, or they can set the doormat on fire so you come out and they assault you. These are the tips people share with each other to keep safe from looting. Looters are severely punished. Whenever caught getting tied to poles or trees, the only thing I want to say is that maybe some deserved it while others maybe didn't. I just think that if people are stuck in a besieged city, starve for a long time with no help, if they grab something from the shop, this shouldn't be considered a crime. In any case, local residents say that there is less crime now than before the war, as weird as it is. But that is because there are many checkpoints. Lots of armed people around. Take our building, for example. It's got security detail of its own. Then there's backup from security agencies, fully equipped. And on top of that, guys volunteer to patrol. To patrol the streets at night. And they're also armed. Overall, it feels very uneasy here. People get nervous when they see a camera. Everyone's scared that photos or videos might be used to adjust fire. So imagine how naive I was. I packed a drone with me to Odessa. I really thought that I might be allowed to fly it here. I dare not even mention it to anyone now because the best case scenario, they'll think I'm a bit cuckoo. The worst case scenario, I'll get more attention and security checks. The camera drone. I'm scared enough to shoot with my phone as it is. As it gets darker, people disappear from the streets completely. Curfew starts at 9 p.m. and it is very strict. You can get arrested for violating it. It's 6.30 p.m. and as time goes, I see fewer people around because after 9 p.m. no one is allowed to be out except the military. And I'm trying to finish my walking tour faster. 
I'm in a hurry to get back to my hotel and I walk into a shopping street with some famous brands. All of these used to be shops. This is what most shops look like now in Odessa, sealed with plywood. This is an Adidas store here. That's how store owners in the city centre have secured their property. From the looting, I guess, or whatever damage. They just sealed off all the windows with plywood. Here they also use some dark film so that no one could see what's inside. And that is what pretty much all shops, cafes and restaurants in Odessa look like now. Even now, some are open for business. Most of the stores are closed. You're lucky if you find one that's open out of a dozen that aren't. The rest are closed and sealed off with film or plywood. It's 20 to 9. And those few people I still see are only there to take their dogs out. I notice an ad board. I'm curious what people are selling and buying during a war. Mostly trying to sell their property, I see. Right next to it, I see a poster for, you won't believe it, a concert by Spleen scheduled for summer. I have a feeling that this poster is outdated. I know rock band is coming to Odessa this summer. I make it to my hotel right before the curfew time, but I need to make sure my car is safe too. I ask the hotel owner if it's okay to leave the car parked out on the street. She said, are you kidding? We've got two security checkpoints around the corner and two more militia posts. You won't find a safer spot in Odessa. I went to bed only to be woken up by an air raid alert. First of all, I wasn't sure what I heard. And indeed, there were three explosions. Then I saw confirmation in Telegram. I can hear the alert sound. It's very distant, not loud at all. I have no idea what to do. I'm panic stricken. I grab some things and run for the basement. I'm joined by other hotel guests, mostly refugees. It's all clear now. I see reports in Telegram that Kuryalnik was bombed. It is a place some 10 kilometers away. I'm scared, although everyone else in the hotel is just fine. People talk, laugh and wait for it to be over. There's no panic. Well, it is over now and I can go to bed again. But I don't feel like sleeping anymore, guys. I think I'd rather keep my clothes on. and never take them off again. Two hours later and I still can't get over it. I realized that I took all the wrong things when I packed. When I heard the alert signal, I knew I wasn't ready for this. I just threw things around when I unpacked things like I always do. So I had no idea what to grab when it was time to run. And I took all the wrong stuff. I didn't take my ID with me, I took my phone. And some stuff I didn't even need. I'm going to keep all my things in one place now. In one place. Well, it turns out I even got some sleep. About five hours. Tourism in Odessa suffered a heavy blow from the war. There are no visitors here, only journalists, bloggers and refugees fleeing other cities. It was only to be expected that war would affect hospitality businesses. The prices are really low. My room in the heart of Odessa now costs 600 Havana. That's half the price it used to be. And hotels aren't half booked. I saw about seven people in the basement. The hotel had 20 rooms. So its capacity is about 40 people, while there were about eight of us here. I'm the only one who's not a refugee. Mostly people flee from Nikolaev, Kherson. I go out, really want to see as much as I can in the city till curfew today. The car is fine. My first mission is to get US dollars changed into Havana. Good morning, I'd like to exchange $50, please. I'm hungry. I spot a McDonald's on the corner, but it's closed. I'm looking for a place for breakfast, but everything's closed. Or at least not open yet. 
but it is half past ten. I check out a grocery shop downstairs. I ask around if I can get some food anywhere these days. So all the cafes are closed around here. That's right. Why? I was just hoping to find a cafe. Can I get some pizza? A pizza place? Yes. Everything else is closed, right? I mean the cafes. They mostly are. Some are open though. Or sometimes they are open, sometimes they are not. It's hard to say. This pizza place is open for sure. You can order pizza to go. I continue my search and finally found a place to eat. You can't tell if this place is open by the way it looks. All the windows are covered in sheets of metal. I'm in the center of Odessa, having a bite in a cafe. I'm not in a basement. That's not why it's so dark inside. In fact, this place is on a very busy corner and is made of glass. Right now, it's fully covered with roofing sheets. You can see all the glass panels here have been secured from the outside, and that is a lot of glass. That is why it looks like this, and there's a good reason for it. It's true that many fled Odessa since the war began, but for many others, it has become a safe haven. I'm talking about refugees who managed to escape from the cities that have been affected by the war the most. Many are gone. I haven't heard from many for over 10 days now. This young woman is too scared to tell her name. She fled Kherson and made her way into Odessa just today. There are soldiers, tanks everywhere. People protesting, getting tear gassed. In some places, you can't have your kids even step out because of all the bombing. Thank you. I didn't see them because I didn't dare step out with my son, but they are. The city is running out of food. The mother had to save her child. They say it's going to be worse than in Mariupol. All the exits are being bombed. We fled with a big caravan. We were bombed. There were blasts everywhere. In the city and on the road, the checkpoints. Even though she is now relatively safe, she is still too traumatized by this experience and keeps crying. These days, Odessa is the destination for many people fleeing the war zone. Vika came here from Mariupol. It all started on the 21st of February. Panic spread. People queued to withdraw all their cash from ATMs because many shops stopped taking cards. People started to buy food in bulk, grain, cereals, sugar, tissues. It was chaos. Vika now feels safe. She fled to Odessa with her son. I don't want to show my face because my husband serves in the army, so I fear for my safety, for my life and for the life of my child. Vika's life is now split into two periods, before and after. She's still in shock. In early March, shops started closing. The city was shelled. There was shooting on the streets. People started to loot drugstores, pawn shops, grabbing all they could because no one knew how long they would need to survive. In just a matter of days, chaos and darkness descended on the city. There was no electricity, no central heating, no connection, no water, no gas. We made fires to cook. Some used their outdoor grill stands. I saw people build an oven of bricks, all cooked outdoors. Every morning we would go out to boil some water. We had to carry water from a gully it was a 20-minute walk. We used barrel galley water for cooking. We cooked close to the entrance to our building, so we could run for the basement in case of shining or an air raid. 
As soon as the attack was over, I would go out and cook in again. Vika tried to leave Mariupol for several weeks. The city was not only a hell to live in, but also hard to leave. We wanted to go but couldn't do it because there was no gas on sale or it was hugely overpriced. We also couldn't hire anyone to drive us. Cars were packed, entire families fled. Some charged $1,000 or even $2,000 per person to provide passage to Berdansk or Mangushev. Many worked on foot to Melekin or Berdansk. But I was too scared to go on foot with my son because of all the shooting, chaining, explosions around. They were rescued by volunteers who brought the mother and son to Odessa. As we were talking, an air raid siren sounds. Wait, what, what is it? An air alert? Yeah. That's an air alert. An air alert? Wait a second. Will you excuse me? I was shooting an interview. An air raid alert went on. Over there. But Vika didn't even flinch. She's so used to all this by now that she doesn't even pay attention. We both got used to the air alerts because we only had them while there was electricity in the city. After it was cut off, there were no alerts anymore. Only the sound of bombs hitting the buildings around us and exploding. Compared to Mariupol, Odessa is a peaceful place. Vika has no idea how to live now. Everything her family has built over the years is now gone. It's clear that we'll have to start over again from scratch because we don't know what will happen to our apartment in Mariupol. We have no home. We came here as we were, with no staff, so we'll start from scratch. But I still want to go home. Of course she knows home might not even be there. The city is destroyed. My parents are still there. We left on the 21st of March and they stayed in the basement with some of the others. There is no way we could live there again. No, at least for another 20 years. Some of the people on her block died in Mariupol. The building next door was hit. Three people died. Three people? Yes. Did you know them? No. Then, yet another residential building was hit, although they say no one died. If you don't count the frequent air alerts, you might think for a second that nothing's wrong. Just another peaceful day. City lawns are being tended to, but then you look up and see anti-tank obstacles around them. Fortifications, checkpoints, constant threat of getting hit by an air raid or artillery fire. The fear for your life starts to consume you. I got an update on yesterday's bombing. A village called Krasnoshelka was hit. Here it is. While I'm right in the center of Odessa, and that is over just around 10 kilometers between us. And yes, it was scary. I can't imagine what it feels like if you're close to it. People told me what it feels like. They even get used to it. You can't fathom it unless you go through the same living like this for weeks, months. Before the war, this was a hit place. Now it houses a volunteer service hub, and it's a special place. Why? These volunteers are here not to help civilians or refugees. The way they do it in my country, Moldova or elsewhere in Europe, here the volunteers are trying to help the troops. And not the regular troops, but the militia squads manned with volunteers. We have a newly established force in addition to the army, called the Territorial Defence Force. Men volunteered to defend the country in February, and the state had no time to supply these squads with everything they needed, so we volunteer to help. Pyotr Ubakov is an MP with Odessa City Council. He now volunteers here. We're channeling supplies to the Territorial Defense Militia, to all those volunteers who went to the front after February the 24th. And where did they come from? I'm not sure, probably some beauty product seller. 
probably a beauty product shop had some sunscreen in stock and donated it because soldiers are already in need of sunscreen. So imagine that, they even provide sunscreen. Of course, top priority supplies are food and clothing. This huge food court now serves as a storage and a logistics center that channels all supplies to the destinations. Ukraine's colors are everywhere. Now do you see the windows? They're taped crosswise, and you already know what that means. The windows have been taped in case this area gets bombed to prevent the glass from shattering. Without the tape, the glass will shatter into many small shards that can hurt the people. Taping prevents this, and the glass can hurt considerably fewer people this way. It is a safety measure, and people do the same in their homes. In case of an air alert, here is where you go, assigned to the bomb shelter. I'm now going to a local, self-organized manufacturing plant in a basement of a building in central Odessa. These guys have been making body armor for the Ukrainian army and militia since day one. They'll tell their story now. We manufacture plate carriers. It's lightweight body armor. These aren't proper bulletproof vests. They're plate carriers fitted with armor plates. Any panels that can protect from certain projectiles. We also make pouches for loaded and empty AK-47 magazines. We also make load carrying systems. We're not professionals, we're just a group of guys who decided we need to do something when the war started. None of them had ever done anything like this before. They've been making these pieces by trial and error. After the first shooting test, we realized that on top of the problem that the plate should be able to stop the bullet, we had another, we, we needed to add a layer to absorb the fragments. Because when the bullet hits the plate, it can break into fragments. And that can hurt a soldier more than a bullet that's in one place. An army doctor told us that it's sometimes easier to save a man who wasn't wearing this kind of armor. A common threat united lots of different people who previously shared different views. Dimitri here is now a logistics manager in yet another volunteer center. I knew I wasn't going to leave. It's my land, my home. There is no way I'm leaving it. So I was looking at two options, to join the militia or, since I have no military training, to help with logistics. And then I got this opportunity to work in logistics in Odessa's regional humanitarian aid center. The center Dmitri is working for is located not far from the trade union house in Odessa, where the tragedy of May the 2nd, 2014 happened six years ago. Violent clashes between Euromaidan and Anti-Maidan protesters escalated, taking the lives of 48 people here. The two sides differ in interpretations of what happened, depending on their political views. Russian authorities blame Ukraine's radical forces for the tragedy, while Kiev said the protests were organized as part of a provocation campaign seeking to have Odessa break away from Ukraine, the way Donetsk and Lugansk did. This remains one of the bloodiest days in Odessa's modern history. Both Odessa residents and those who have come here from other parts of Ukraine fleeing the bombings are worried about their future. People see no point in making short-term plans. No one knows what tomorrow will bring. Until recently, Karina lived in her apartment in Mariupol. Now she doesn't even know if that building still stands. The first couple of days we stayed in the apartment. Then, after the building was hit, we hid in the basement and lived there. We had no electricity, water or gas. To survive, they cooked food on fire. We made fire. It was a bit of an overkill, but my husband actually built a tandoori oven. It was his DIY project and it worked well. 
but overall it was dangerous. We cooked while the bombs landed around and bullet fire came every now and then. They looked for underground springs to get drinking water and used technical water from the heating system for washing. There were no windows in our apartment. We couldn't stay there, but it was frightfully cold, especially for the baby. So we lived in the basement for months. The apartment had big holes from the blasts, open to all winds. But not only women and children flee their ruined homes. Meet Igor and Slava from Nikolaev. It all started when we woke up on February. On February 24th, around 4.30 a.m., to the sound of explosions. Panic broke out. People didn't know what to expect. Queued for food, fuel. So we decided with my brother to evacuate our families from the city because we were bombed the next night again. And I have two children, a baby boy, 12 months old, and a six-year-old daughter. After Igor and Slava made sure their families were safe, they wanted to join the Territorial Defense Militia. But they were told no more volunteers were needed and offered them a job delivering supplies to checkpoints. On one of these missions, the brothers were under fire. We were 10 kilometers out on the way home. And my brother told me, look at the windshield. So I looked up and saw the right side of the windshield that it had these perforations. We had no idea what it was. Slava figured out we had to stop, but his leg was already numb because it had been hit by a bullet. So these bullets were coming in, yet there was no sound of explosion. We just heard them pop against the truck. His legs were numb, he couldn't use the brakes. So he decided to drive the truck into a road safety barrier just to stop it. They pulled us out, provided first medical aid, stitched me up. That is, I mean, they didn't, they applied tourniquets. I got one bullet in my right thigh, one exit wound, and one bullet got stuck in my thigh. And I've got a bullet in my left calf where it broke my calf bone. They removed one bullet from my right leg, but the other one in the knee is still there. Work in progress, so they say. Mission accomplished, but they got wounded in their legs, feet, and even ribs. They decided to keep the bullets as a memento. This piece of metal is from my right rib, and I've got lots of fragments lodged in both legs. See these white spots? These are fragments. So you can see here, my calf, my calf bone is broken, and all these tiny spots are all bits of metal that I'll have for the rest of my life. So we will now, as I have fragments lodged too, we'll set off all alarms. In all airports? Yes. I want you to understand that normality at 8.30 p.m. on such a fine day, Odessa's downtown area will be crawling with people and now you won't see a single person. The few cars I see are all in a hurry to get home. Cafes were always full of people and now they're empty. Look at this one, for example. completely deserted. Even though air raid sirens keep everyone on their toes, some people still dare to go out. Nikolai Serga, ex-host of a popular TV show, Heads and Tails, kindly agreed to talk to me. If you compare to how Odessa was 12 months ago, of course it's very uneasy and unstable. If you compare to how things were a couple of weeks ago, a month ago, people are starting to get used to it. To go about their daily lives, almost like they did before, if I can say that. Nikolai is now in the Ukrainian army. He completed a course of military training as a student, and now was called to serve as a junior officer. You know that yesterday three missiles came in. And when Russian ships launched these missiles, they also activated radar jamming systems. So unfortunately, those missiles were only partially intercepted by our air defences. 
while some reached the shore. And only after that the air alert was activated. So yesterday's situation was really a bad one because we were hit before the alert went up. Like many other Ukrainian talents on TV, Nikolai had some strong ties with Russia. He lived, studied and worked there. But now he has completely revised his thoughts on the subject. I recall watching you on Russia's TNT channel some 15 years ago and you probably did a lot of gigs in Russia. I believe many Russians will watch this video report. I'm convinced they will, so perhaps you'd like to address them. Would you like to say something to them if it makes sense at all? I don't see a lot of sense in it. Because those who, you know, it has been long enough now for those who I've, who've got any sense to figure out what's going on, to figure out where their loyalties lie and who is who, as they say. So I don't think there's getting through to those people who have figured, out, figured it out the other way. February 24th became the day that divided the life in Odessa and Ukraine on the whole into two parts, before and after. Up until now, Lubya could only say but a few words in Ukrainian. Today, she believes it is critical that she should speak her own country's language. My mother tongue is Ukrainian, and I was taught Ukrainian in school. But we also had another official language, I, Russian. We also studied Russian literature and the Russian grammar. In 2013, when a law was passed and Russian was no longer an official language, it was the right move, and I completely supported it. You can speak whatever language you want, so there should only be one official language and it is Ukrainian. I fully support that. Even if we speak Russian, it doesn't mean all state affairs should be conducted in Russian, because we all understand Ukrainian. And although my entire family, we are all Russian-speaking Ukrainians and speak Russian all our lives, when missiles hit Odessa at 5.30 a.m. and I saw our president's address in Telegram, I knew that I will only speak Ukrainian from now on, only Ukrainian. This is Lubia's position, and yet all staff meetings in Odessa's volunteer center are conducted in Russian even today. Because it's easier for everyone, even though after the events in Crimea, Kiev updated the law to have one official state language and all paperwork must be in Ukrainian. Yet in everyday life, people speak whatever they please. I'll give you an example. All this hysteria on Russian news channels is very weird, because I come from a Russian-speaking family. And I've never had a problem speaking Russian instead of Ukrainian. I've never been harassed on the streets, or persecuted, or imprisoned, or forced to speak Ukrainian, because I can speak it too anyway. I can speak Russian or Ukrainian, as I wish. And I don't have any kind of ideas that I must not speak only one language and not another. This is the beach in Chernomorka, Odessa. Odessa's vacation beach area. I used to come here for summer holidays, and today I came here to show you the beach. It was this beach, amongst many, that provided all the sand for sandbags to reinforce the checkpoints. You can see by the poles on this swing how much sand has been removed from the beach, a huge amount. After Ukraine lost Crimea, Odessa became the country's top seaside resort. Before the war, up to three million tourists would come here annually. But now both the beaches and hotels are empty. Instead of vacationers, you can see here signs that say, danger mines. But this guy doesn't give a damn. This guy knows no fear, for all I can see. The sign Danger Mines actually means that there are mines beyond the sign. But he couldn't care less, and he's not the only one. I spot another young guy on the beach. It says mines. Aren't you afraid? Of course I am, but they should be beyond the sign. Well, here it should be alright. So you're taking chances? Yup. Are you looking for something you lost? Yes, I see, okay. I saw videos of people going for a swim right here on Langeron Beach, which is full of mines. And they seemed to get away with it. But then there was an incident. One car exploded here on a mine. 
I'm pretty sure someone would be swimming here now too, but today is very windy. I guess people just figured out, oh, okay. Well, we'll just take a stroll amongst the mines. Thank you for bringing my children alive. Here in this apartment in Odessa, I'm talking to Zoya, who delivers humanitarian aid to people in Mariupol. She has lists of items and addresses right here. It says which basement, which address, which drugs they need or dearbers, whether there are any wounded, sick or disabled people or pregnant women. That's a lot of information. We mostly exchange messages via Viber, but when the phone freezes, we write it down on paper. They deliver humanitarian aid to the cities and villages close to the front. Getting in touch with those who need it is a major challenge. There's no signal in many areas. Sometimes the delivery comes, but it's already too late. There were five people, an elderly woman, her daughter and so-in-law, and their kids. And their apartment building was hit, and fire broke out, and the man jumped out or ran out. He was close to exit. He got bad burns, but he lived while all the women in that family got killed. Volunteers also try to evacuate people from active war zones. Many who tried to escape ran out of fuel and got stuck there. But for the volunteers, every such trip could become the last. There are thousands of people there with no fuel, no way to escape. We can't deliver fuel to all of them. We can only provide our volunteer drivers with fuel to let them a round trip because in those parts they can't buy any. They go there and lose phone connection. They have no chance to get more fuel and only God knows. Vladimir is one of such drivers who has been delivering items prepared by Zoya to Mariupol and evacuating people from there. And he recently went off grid. Zoya is very worried. Is that him in Mariupol? Yes, it's Mariupol evacuating people. Here he is. People got into the one. He has an opening there so they could get air inside. Here. Just a second. This is from the pigs he took in Mariupol when he was there. He brought all these people here. During a war, people show their true colors. And while some help each other, no questions asked, others choose another course of action. Some people promised to help find the missing driver for a fee, but once they got the money, they never picked up the phone again. An entire black market has emerged here offering to evacuate people from the war zones to safety for large sums of money. Yes, they can charge up to 2,000 US dollars to evacuate people from Mariupol. They take the money and disappear. I don't think they even plan to try. They just make money taking advantage of people's tragedies. And people are willing to pay. They ask for loans. They find ways to raise the sums. People are willing to pay to keep their families alive. An air alert is on and I have to cross the city. I feel nervous. Is that an air alert again? Yes. I ran a bit late filming that interview. I'm on the outskirts of Odessa and I've only 25 minutes to get to the city center. My navigation app says I can make it, but I'm still nervous. Other cars are speeding up too, because they need to be home by 9 p.m. This car on the right is passing. The air warning is still on, and I need to go through a few checkpoints. Mm -hmm. 
This might look strange to you. Possibly I'll find it strange too when I watch this video later. I wasn't shot at. I'm alright. But nonetheless, I would at times experience something like panic attacks. When you just get scared and that's it. I don't really know what it is. For one, I'm in a country with an active war zone. Also, I have to hurry to make it home before curfew. I was stopped like four times today by armed soldiers who check my papers and my phone. And who knows what they're thinking? They seemed okay, but what if one day one of them is not okay? I have no idea what can happen to me. In a country where martial law is in effect, the military have unlimited authority. Also, there were two air raid alerts today, two actual bombing episodes. All these negative thoughts pop in my mind, triggered by the panic. There are no official statistics, but we believe that about 40% of Odessa's population have left the city. Yuri Dimtroglo is an MP with the regional parliament, or RADA. He says the panic of the first days has subsided. People are starting to come back home. During the past two weeks, I've seen a lot of people return. You probably even noticed some minor traffic jams. The situation is getting better, especially this last week. People are getting used to the air raids, and our air defences are working well. Even occasional explosions don't scare them much now. People are coming back because there's no place like home. Obviously, there's no filming any defence facilities or activities here, but Mr Dimchoglo has assured me that Odessa is fully ready. Odessa has been ready since day one of the war, since February 24th. You saw the city for yourself today. We call Odessa, and the areas around it, the resort and military district. That's right. In other words, we're combat ready. But on the other hand, life here is more like that on a seaside resort compared to other cities in the east. Yuri says that Odessa is less likely to be hit by strikes than surrounding areas because the city has a very serious air defence shield. It protects us from the air, from the sea, and if you were here yesterday evening, you would have seen that our air defences operate very well, so we're ready. Since day one, Odessa's air defences have performed exceptionally well, intercepting enemy aircraft and projectiles, both sea-launched and air-launched. Only cruise missiles sometimes get through. Despite the war, life in the city goes on. Shops, cafes and restaurants are reopening one by one. All businesses outside the active war zone should be open. I'm sure you've seen around many cafes and shops working. Almost all supermarkets are open as well. Banks are also open, so there's no problem with those. All the city infrastructure and support systems are operational to serve the population. During the first week, yes. Yes, well, not in the city. Twelve people were killed in an airstrike near Podolsk. Podolsk is close to Moldova. Yes, it is Kotovsk now. Then I ran into reinforced checkpoints and more militia. I had to improvise. I recall renting a place here on French Boulevard two years ago for a summer holiday. Those were the times. The navigation app is proving to be quite useless during the war. I rely on it less and less because I always end up running into some checkpoint. I have to turn around and look for an alternative, which is exactly what I'm doing now. I need to eat between my appointments. In this small shop downstairs, I find coffee and a hot dog. That is my lunch, since Odessa's eateries are all closed. While I'm finishing my hot dog, I come across an unusual sight. A couple of newlyweds, a bride in an elegant dress, and the groom looking neat. In a time like this, you decide to get married, huh? Could you just please say a few words? Well, we were scheduled for March 18th. And um, because of this situation, you postponed? Well, yeah, it got postponed, but once they reopened, they called us. And on this street, protective netting is being installed on the buildings to secure this debris in case of direct hits. You can see protection being stalled on this building to catch the debris if it gets damaged. Looks like someone stocked empty boxes on top of each other so that no one could see what was inside. 
This area has many security checkpoints, and militia patrols it day and night. Many are very unhappy with me on filming. Two days here have made it clear that a camera or a phone camera in my hands makes everyone nervous. From old ladies to militia on duty, I was stopped for a security check a number of times. They checked my footage on the phone, on SD cards, which is why I'm no longer eager to shoot outside. I can't even stand the thought of another check when I see militia. Note the walls. All the signs informing the street names and house numbers have been removed. Whenever they check my footage, they make sure it contains no indications of exact locations. Taking photos or video of street signs is not allowed. All city signs have been removed, like this one, or covered up, including the directions for tourists. I'll show you. This is done for a reason. As a measure against artillery attacks. On my third day in Odessa, I slept through an air alarm. That was the first. I saw the news of an airstrike, a pretty massive one, by the way, after it happened. It's all on Telegram. An explosion hit Chernomorsk at 7.52 a.m. That's in Odessa's suburbs. And I woke up around 9 a.m. Also, reminders are all over Telegram that extended curfew is introduced today. And they will last from the 9th until the 11th of April. Imagine seeing lots of guys with RPGs on their shoulders as you drive. But yet, here I am, thinking, cool, this is Ukraine. Ukraine, you know? Fuck me. So I hit the road to go home in the evening and felt immediate relief. No one stopped me as I left Odessa. I guess it's easier to leave than to enter, and that is logical. I was stopped only once so far, and they asked me why I'm going to Chisinau. They probably didn't notice my Moldovan license plate. So I said I'm Moldovan and going home. It took me a full 10 minutes to figure out why the, that guy was thrown to hear I was going to Chisinau. Though that is where deserters are trying to flee. It's been in the news. Deserters caught in the fields on their way to Moldova. And I just told him I'm going to Moldova and I'm young enough to be a draftee. When he saw my passport, he knew I was legit and we had a laugh. An hour and a half later, I'm on the border. About 40 vehicles are queuing, all Ukrainian. This confirms what many said today, that Odessa doesn't feel that safe anymore. During the last three days I spent there, there were way too many airstrikes. So people are queuing again to get out, and the customs and border control posts are busy again. As soon as I cross the border, I feel I can breathe again. I've never felt so good before. I was cleared by the customs, cross the border to Moldova from Ukraine and I feel so much better for it. Because while I was in Odessa, I kept having all sorts of thoughts about what might happen next to me. And these thoughts are as wild as you let them be. I've got a pretty wild imagination, so... I was very busy figuring out what peril I might find myself in every step of the way. Picturing all sorts of tragic outcomes in my mind. Here I am, feeling so much better now. Even though I'm looking at a few more hours drive until I get to Chisinau, that's where I can get some air alert free sleep. 
and I wish you the same. Goodbye. <laughs>